It's time for Thriller Thursdays, here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Chapter 18 Kip Baxter was just about fed up with this. More than two hours had passed since she had found this spot, a reasonably sheltered bit of rooftop near the river crossing. Max had actually managed to fall asleep, relieved to be free of his limiters and out of hiding at last. Didn't matter that they were headed into far greater danger, or that the Red Panda had yet to check in. His relief had been palpable, and he settled in immediately, and slept sitting up in the corner with his back against the low walls that surrounded the rooftop. She stood and looked over the Nile, if for no other reason than it kept her from looking out over the city again, watching for the Red Panda. Part of her seemed to register that this was actually the Nile, and that if she was going to be in Egypt, she really ought to look at it. But her eyes stared blankly without really seeing much beyond the cold facts. The moon had returned from wherever Thatcher had hidden it about forty minutes ago, and the water shone in its low-hanging light. After a moment, she sat down again with a thump, and realized that the red panda was sitting beside her as silent as the grave. She tried to keep a straight face. In fact, she tried to give no reaction at all, and only realized that she failed utterly at this when she saw his face break into a wide grin. He didn't do a lot of that, at least not at close quarters like this. She wondered if he would do more or less of it if he knew how weak it made her in the knees. For a moment she said nothing, waiting for the impulse to kiss him to go away. After five or six seconds she realized that it probably wasn't going to and she should just get on with her day. "'You could have called,' she said calmly. "'I could have,' he admitted. "'But I wouldn't have seen your eyes pop out of their sockets like that. That was nice.' The flying squirrel's heart was racing and it wouldn't stop. She wondered if his lenses were set on infrared— She must have been glowing brilliantly with the heat she could feel in her face. The trouble was that, in the act of surprising her, he had sat right next to her. When she had flopped back down to sit, they were shoulder to shoulder against a low wall. They never sat this close, but they were already sitting. Neither one of them could move casually. She swallowed hard and kept her tone calm and even. How did the whole crazed death jackal thing go? He shrugged casually. "'About as well as you might expect,' he said. "'Stayed out of their way, disrupted traffic. "'Wondered a few dozen times how long this was going to go on. "'And then suddenly they all bolted, in every direction at once. "'I imagine the spell had worn off. "'It was quite a thing to see, really.' "'He looked at her lips. "'It was hard to tell exactly where he was looking with those spooky blank mask lenses, "'but she was sure he had looked at her lips.' Kit Baxter hadn't exactly done a whole lot of kissing in her time, but most of the fellas she had ever met had strongly considered it, and she knew when her lips were under scrutiny. She was almost sure that she did. But why had he looked? Were they parted invitingly? Had she leaned in toward him ever so slightly? Was she sitting there just begging to be kissed like some stupid girl, like like one of the high-society trollops that threw themselves at him and were met with cold contempt? She was almost certain that he was still looking at them, or looking again. Maybe. (laughs) What would the harm be? They were far from home on the banks of the Nile. He had just done some very fine death-defying... He certainly seemed to be wondering what it would be like. Would it really be the end of the world if she were to let him find out? Oh, there you are, dear boy. The stranger's voice came out of nowhere and made them both jump slightly. Kit had forgotten he was there. Ten thousand miles to rescue him, and he had just kind of slipped her mind. "'How are you feeling?' the Red Panda asked Falcone. "'Better, I think,' Max smiled. "'I drifted off there. Not long, but better than I have in days.' "'It might not be a bad idea,' she offered. "'I know somebody else who is on his second straight night.' The Red Panda smiled but shook his head. "'Plenty of time for that later,' he said. Since Thatcher, Pavley, and company tried to kill us rather than capture us, it stands to reason that they think they may have found a way to find the Eye without Max's help. Falcone nodded. It would be best if we beat them to it. 
he agreed in quiet understatement. Right, Kit said, making it unanimous. We need a boat. There are certain things that are almost universal, things that do not change that much no matter where you go. Men who work the waters of a river have a certain sense about them, an awareness of the smallness and fragility of the human form, for one thing. Most would never put it that way, but when your partner in daily life is a mighty, inexorable force of nature, it gives a man a certain sense of his real place, his true power, or the almost utter lack thereof. Other people may rush about like they are the greatest power on the planet, or under the illusion that they have the ability to control their own corner of the world. But a river man knows different. There is a certain, almost philosophical acceptance of whatever comes, and a quiet confidence in his ability to deal with it. The boatman who took them across the Nile was just such a man. Crossing the hours before sunrise, with an old man, a young man, and a red mask, and a girl in a heart-stopping cat suit, why not? The girl gave him a moment's pause, for she had a shape that would distract the prophet himself. But it was not for the boatman to wonder why this odd trio made for the great field at this hour. White people were all crazy anyway, and these ones paid well. The walk from the landing was not long, but it was tense. The three heroes moved quickly and quietly, their eyes keenly peeled for any trace of their enemies. Should they fall into another surprise attack— there was a dearth of rooftops on this side of the river to escape to. The edges of the sky were just beginning to creep back into color, traces of deep reds starting to form on the horizon. The flying squirrel could just see the shape of the valley stretched out before them, a hard, deep trench carved out of the rolling hills of rock beyond. From somewhere far ahead, they heard the ringing of voices and the flash of lights. They moved fast and kept low, and soon found themselves concealed behind a stone wall overlooking the valley. "'What are those idiots up to?' Kit wondered aloud. "'Locate a spell,' Falcone said simply, straining for a better view. "'I thought you said that wouldn't work,' the Red Panda frowned. "'The magic of the Egyptians being on something of a unique frequency or some such?' Falcone smiled. Or some such was the red panda's way of not quite believing what was going on right in front of his eyes. Falcone elected not to fight this battle again with his former student. They aren't looking for magic at all, Falcone said. It looks like Pavle is trying to detect open spaces beneath the ground. It's an interesting approach. I thought we were looking for a pyramid, Kit said. There aren't any pyramids, the red panda shook his head. The Valley of the Kings is a new kingdom site. She smiled sweetly. Pretend I don't know anything about Egyptology, she said. It means the pyramids are much, much older than the tombs in this valley, he replied. The seat of Egyptian power did not shift to Thebes until long after the great pyramids at Giza were built. But the old man told you we were looking for a pyramid, she said. The first and greatest of the pyramids? Yes, the Red Panda admitted. But why? At that time, this was a provincial backwater. Why build such a thing so far from your civilization? Falcone thought about this for a moment. Because you, or at least Pharaoh, are trying to contain a mighty relic that you'd just as soon never seen again without offending the god of the underworld, as Anubis was thought to be at the time. All right, the red panda nodded. So Pavli knows what we know, and he has resolved this conflict by assuming that the pyramid is underground. Why? Because it isn't anywhere else, Falcone offered. Well, there is that, yes, the red panda said. There are many different kinds of pyramids in Egypt, Falcone said, and if the pyramid of Anubis, as we may call it, was the first, it might be quite unlike any that followed. It could have been dug underground, perhaps even inverted. The sun drew nearer to the horizon, and the sky began to blaze with deep and growing red light. It fell upon the valley and the majestic peak that dominated it. Kit blinked at the mountain. What's that? she asked. The red panda turned his head only slightly. Oh, that's Alkern, he said, as if this explained everything. Some scholars think that the Valley of the Kings became the royal necropolis because Alkern looks so much like a pyramid itself. 
It does look like a pyramid, Kit said simply. A whole lot like a pyramid. The red panda and the stranger looked at one another and said nothing for a moment. Is it possible? Falcone said at last. The red panda gave his head a small shake. Build a pyramid and then bury it to look like a mountain? He asked. Why? Falcone shrugged. If that's how it happened at all, he said. The desert could have handled the hiding, I suppose. Or perhaps they were trying to contain a mighty relic that they just as soon have never seen again without offending the god of the underworld. It's too fantastic, the red panda said quietly. Okay, kids. Well, here's my thing, Kit said, enjoying being the one with the actual idea. Forgetting for a moment that the baddies are currently spread out all over the valley, and that we'd just as soon not get into a dust-up with Merlin and the Merliner if we can avoid it. She paused a moment to listen for opposition to this, and found none. If we assume that there is a pyramid here somewhere, we can either do what they're doing and look for the whole entire thing underground, or we can walk over there and check out the big pyramid-shaped thing. Both men regarded her in mild astonishment. The flying squirrel smiled and looked back and forth between them for a moment. "'She's quite clever, you know,' Falcone said at last. "'Yes, she is,' the red panda agreed proudly. "'And quite lovely,' Falcone added helpfully. The red panda said nothing, but shifted uncomfortably. "'One of us should probably take her dancing,' Falcone continued, ignoring Kit's unspoken desire for him to please shut up. "'Yes, well,' the red panda said, changing the subject just enough. First things first. So, do you like comedy? If you do, then Friday Follies might be just the feed for you. From the Mutual Audio Network, every Friday we bring you a selection of hilarious audio drama... And you can find it wherever you find your podcasts. Just search for Friday Follies, or you could subscribe to the main Mutual Audio Network feed. It's up to you. Find us there. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.